Here at Venger, we love GraphQL. I've been using it for about six years since we started the project. It powers all of our e-commerce APIs, but I recently realized I've never really been doing GraphQL right all of these years. I'm gonna explain what I mean by that later, but first of all, let's take a look at the state of GraphQL. So GraphQL has had its ups and downs, right? When it came out, it was released by Facebook, it was like the big hype, of course. We've got the peak of inflated expectations, use it everywhere, rest is dead, all of these kind of things. Of course, people just shoved GraphQL everywhere that it wasn't needed. Looking at you, Gatsby. Um, you know, GraphQL front ends for your database, machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication, configuring things in GraphQL, whatever. Uh, it's the typical hype cycle, okay? And then, of course, what follows is the backlash. Hey, GraphQL's too complex. Only companies the size of Facebook actually need to use it. Uh, the overhead's not worth it, you can't cash it, all of these things. And the fact is, all technologies have trade-offs and the hype cycle is just the phenomenon of not realizing the trade-offs, then realizing that there are trade-offs, and eventually you come to this plateau of productivity where the trade-offs are well understood and you can now finally sit back and say, okay, this is where it makes sense, this is where it doesn't quite make sense. All that said, for what we build in Venger, which is highly custom e-commerce applications. GraphQL is a perfect fit. And I go into that a bit more in the documentation. Our very second page of docs is an introduction to GraphQL, where we also lay out the arguments for why it makes a lot of sense in this case. Anyway, I wanna talk about two aspects of GraphQL. The first one being one of the superpowers of GraphQL, which is the end-to-end -end type safety you get because the schema is static, TypeScript is static, you join them together with code generation and it is an amazing developer experience with one big drawback. It adds complexity to your project. Now, if you're using code generation, you're probably using GraphQL code generator from the Guild. The Guild are absolute pioneers in the GraphQL space. And this is a fantastic project. I use it for basically every GraphQL uh, app that I'm building both on the front end and the back end. The way code generation is done has evolved over time, but we seem to have arrived at this point where we've got this client preset, which uses GraphQL typed document nodes to give you very, very powerful, correct typings with minimal amounts of code that you actually have to write. Now there's two drawbacks to this. First is I already mentioned extra setup. I mean, we've already got what? Uh, maybe we've got a mono re repo setup. We, of course, are using TypeScript. We're maybe uh, using other build tools. We're watching files. We're generating this and that. You know, the modern tool chain for JavaScript on the front end is pretty complex. GraphQL code gen is just another layer on top of that. So that's one thing. It takes some setting up. Now, the Guild have made this as easy as possible. Uh, they've got CLI uh, tools to make it easier. But still, it's one extra thing to think about. Every time you change a file, every time you add a property to a query, a field to a query, you've got to run the code generation again so it can regenerate your types now that it's got this new property on the type. Second thing is if you use this client preset, it's going to increase your bundle size. And I will show you what I mean by that. We can see generated code right here, which is generated by this client preset. And you can see we've overloaded this GraphQL function and it uses a kind of a hash, a plain object where the key is the entire query or mutation or indeed fragment and um, the value points to the actual document node. What this means in practice is that in your, in your bundle, in your app, in the browser, these full strings are duplicated once in this hash object and once in the actual query itself. This is a known issue. Uh, they talk about it here in the docs, how to reduce bundle size. Uh, you can either split it up and lazy load, which is what I've been doing. But still, the, you know, this one right here, you see this bunch of documents is just scoped to a single portion of the app. It's I measured it, it's like 18 kilobytes it's adding. Um, so it's not ideal. Uh, you can reduce it by adding some more steps to your build pipeline with a Babel plugin or SWC plugin. But again, added complexity. Like, is there a way to have the benefits of the client preset, which is really, really convenient, but without having to regenerate types every time you change a document and without this problem with the increased bundle size. Yes, there is. I discovered recently a new project 
which is GraphQL Tada or GQL Tada. Every time I see the name, I think of this sound. Um, so this is a new project which aims to solve both of these problems really and more, which we'll get into, but it's, uh, it comes from this repo from Onoco. Um, the people behind that are a couple of engineers of very high pedigree in the GraphQL community, Phil and Yovi. So thank you guys for bringing us this library. And GQL Tada sells itself as a magical GraphQL query engine for TypeScript. And in short, it passes your GraphQL documents inside the TypeScript type system, which allows you to get all the benefits of code generation without having to generate code each time you change your documents. Let me show you what I mean by this. So I'm actually using it right now in a real application I'm building. And we have right here is a um, Next.js app router app. We've got a, an account route and uh, in the page, we're getting hold of the active customer. So this is our GraphQL document right here. So as you can see, we're getting a bunch of different things, the address, the name, and then some organization data and some licenses. Now let's take a look at where we use that data. So as an example, Right here, we're printing out the customer's email address. So I can use the auto completion to show that TypeScript is indeed aware of the properties that are available. So here's the cool thing, right? Bear in mind, there is no code generation running at the moment. It's just TypeScript. If I remove or indeed comment out the email address and then head back over here, we see now there's an error. Property email address does not exist on the type. Now let's uncomment it and it's back again. So this is just mind blowing stuff. It's all being done inside the TypeScript type system. And this has been tested on large apps with very big schemas and the performance is better than you would expect. So this is the first thing I wanted to show you today, a much easier way to benefit from the end to end type safety of GraphQL. But that's not what I mean when I was talking about doing GraphQL wrong in the past and never doing it the right way. There's one other aspect to this, which is a topic called fragment masking. Now there is, there is a blog post here from Lauren from the Guild, which explains what is meant by fragments, uh, masking of fragments and the benefits it brings. So I recommend you read through this because it really goes into depth about what it's all about. Fragment masking is also supported out of the box by the GraphQL code generator client preset. But it's one of those things that I kind of knew you're supposed to do, but I never actually did it. And in fact, if you know about Relay, which is the GraphQL client used by Facebook on their products. It actually includes this just as the standard. It's a very opinionated GraphQL client, only available for React as far as I know. And it's had the reputation of being kind of complex to get started with. And for that reason, it never really took off in the way that some other GraphQL clients did. And as a result, the concept of fragment masking never really fully went mainstream. And I think there's a lot of GraphQL developers out there like me, who've been doing GraphQL for a long time and have never really dug into this topic and appreciated the power of it until now. This is why I want to tell you about it in this video. So what is fragment masking? Well, I'll read a section out from the blog post. It says, instead of writing one big GraphQL operation for our whole page and passing that down to components, start with describing the components data dependencies through a GraphQL fragment. This way you're making the data dependency of your component co-located and explicit in the same way that you would co-locate the TypeScript definitions or CSS if you are using style components pattern. So, you know, in the front end world, this component architecture has completely become the accepted way to do things. You have your page as the root, and then you basically got a tree of components that fan out from there and you compose them together to get the final view that's displayed in the browser. Fragment masking takes this approach and applies it to the data on the page. So let's say you've got an avatar component and it needs the first name, the last name, and the image. Those are the three data dependencies of that component. Using fragment masking, a fragment will be written, which contains just those three fields on the user type. And this fragment is then passed up to the query that's made at the top of the page and the component can be sure that it will receive the data that it's asked for. I'll show you what that looks like in practice. So again, on this account page, one thing that we have is 
we have a list of licenses. These are rendered by a license card component, which looks like this. It just displays like the product name, um, the order code, the status of the license, the date that the license starts and expires and so on. All of these data dependencies are described in this fragment. So where do we use this fragment? Well, let's jump up to the query that fetches the data for the whole page. And we'll see that here, we're actually using the fragment right there. So the fact that we pass this fragment up into our root query means that the component can be sure that it will have this data available. But what about this word masking in fragment masking? Masking implies some kind of hiding or encapsulation. And that's exactly what we get. In the parent component, the page, if we were to take a look at one of these licenses and see what data we have available, we'll see we've got ID created at and updated at but we don't have the rest of the properties in the fragment that's hidden in this fragment refs property. We have ID created at and updated at because they are declared directly here. If I would remove those, the created at and updated at, we'll see that we actually now only have the ID. That means that the dependencies required by the child component don't leak out and get accidentally depended upon by parent components. This keeps everything encapsulated. It's a very neat way of doing things. And it just so happens that GQL Tada supports this out of the box, fragment collocation. And really when I started using this library, it was the first time for whatever reason, it really clicked for me. And I started using it in the apps that I was building and like it clicked like this is, it just makes so much sense to write apps like this. Things can scale much easier, much more easily. Um, as you do perform refactors, you're going to run into less errors where components that have been moved around no longer get the data that they expect to receive because the data dependencies are packaged together, co-located and move around with the component. And beyond these two aspects, we've looked at the code generation, fragment co-location. GQL Tada is also supporting more advanced features like persisted documents, multiple schemas, and the team working on this are continuously improving it. It's a really exciting project. And I really think it's going to push the whole ecosystem of GraphQL forward. So if you're writing a GraphQL application, check this out, try it out in your next app and see if like me, everything finally clicks into place and you start doing GraphQL the right way.